Social Security, right? You've heard of that, of course, before everybody knows it. Kind of like everybody knows your name. Everybody knows Social Security. Some, of course, wonder about its future existence. But for a program that's been around nearly 90 years, matter of fact, it started in 1935, so that uh, in a few years, a couple of years, uh, it becomes its 90th birthday. There's still a lot of misconceptions on Social Security. And these misconceptions, or dare I say myths, in a lot of people's mind could wind up costing you a lot of money. So that's why often on the program, we talk about Social Security, even bring in our fellow certified financial fiduciary, Rob Field, who also happens to be a national Social Security advisor, into the program to talk about this very topic. So on the program today, we're going to address some sort of common myths and really how you might get around those misconceptions and plan accordingly. Because after all, you're paying into Social Security and you certainly want to, at the end of the day, make sure you're getting every bit of those dollars that you contributed to it in the first place. And then uh, we'll shift gears and talk about one of those powerful savings vehicles And frankly, it just got even more powerful thanks to the folks at the IRS. Unfortunately, the vehicle itself is one of the most widely misunderstood ways to save money. We're talking about health savings accounts with a lot of money already in them, $112 billion. But if you consider... Each year, the average American spends about $400 billion in out-of-pocket medical costs. Well, then, clearly, there's a greater opportunity for folks to be using health savings accounts to help save money, right? When you spend money on medical, I mean, first of all, it's already ridiculous, ridiculously high, right? I mean, if you look at kind of any of your bills, when you use a health savings account, though, at the very least, you wind up getting, like, 22% off, assuming that's your marginal tax bracket. So it's like a 22% off coupon on all your medical expenses when you are using the funds inside of a health savings account. So we're going to talk about that, uh, particularly because you might very well be missing out on using this especially useful, very powerful savings vehicle that now, in fact, thanks to the IRS, and increasing the contribution limits has become more powerful than even before. So welcome on into the program. This, of course, is Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. We're Central Florida's longest-running radio program coming to you on a host of radio stations throughout the Central Florida region. Also happen to be one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web. So make sure you check us out there. My name, of course, is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner and certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning. So certainly been one of those things where we've been at the role that we have had for over 25 years. And I suppose at the end of the day, nothing really should surprise me. You know, once you do something for that long, you know, quarter of a century, you you know, eh, pretty much kind of seen it all. But I guess one of the things that surprises me is just how quickly market sentiment and the markets themselves certainly change pretty quickly. And, and yeah, you know, after 25 years doing it, you'd say, well, you've probably seen it all. Market swing, you know, can swing pretty dramatically one way or the other. But we were talking about this with the rest of the team this past week. And uh, if you know anything about our, our team every morning on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we start off with sort of kind of a round table type of discussion where we go around and talk about kind of what's going on and things that we're seeing or issues that we need to talk about, client matters that need addressing, all of that kind of stuff. So we, we do that. We call that our morning huddle. But So this past week, we were talking in the morning huddle about just how quickly sentiment changes and in particular how quickly sentiment has changed almost it seems like over the course of the past 30 days which is a pretty quick 
turnaround. And so those were some of the thoughts that we uh, put out to our clients in an email uh, that we sent out on Friday. Our, our clients have come to know those and hopefully appreciate them. And we send them out on a regular basis so that uh, folks can get sort of our latest perspective and thoughts and all those kinds of things of what's going on. So that email sort of germinated from kind of a, one of our daily huddles. We we're talking a little bit about kind of investor sentiment and how much it has changed. And, and I guess in a way, isn't that somewhat frustrating, right? Because, you know, you think one thing is going to happen and then another thing actually happens. And at the end of the day, that's always a kind of a frustrating human experience. And um, so we take the notion of a recession, right? And certainly, I, I, I think uh, if, unless you were living under a rock, the media and the internet has been abuzz with this theme that a recession is coming. And, and at some point, it sort of almost becomes the most widely anticipated reception ever on record, except that sometimes when you anticipate things, they don't really turn out the way that you think they're going to. And then sentiment and those kinds of things can really change pretty dramatically. And what's interesting is there almost seems to be this sort of growing school of thought. And I first heard, sort of heard this thought about maybe a couple of months ago now, uh, when we were talking with some senior investment folks, uh, some investment managers, mutual fund managers. And, and so they kind of made this suggestion. And I was originally like, eh, I'm not sure if they're maybe, you know, just trying to convince me to, you know, put more money into their investments or what they're trying to do. But as I thought about it, and then we fast forward eight weeks, well, lo and behold, there, there's actually sort of now this sort of growing conversation that maybe the recession came, maybe the recession already happened. And I suppose if you think all the way back to last year, and I know that's hard because, you know, everybody's attention span out there these days, especially if you're under 30, it's like 10 seconds. Believe me, I see that every day because I got three under 30, uh, under 25, even uh, kids back at the house these days. But if you think all the way back to last year, First quarter, second quarter, there was negative GDP, right? So if you have two quarters in a row where you've got negative economic growth, then that sort of meets the technical definition of a recession. The only problem is, if you think all the way back to last year, well, last year was, in fact, an election year. So maybe there was a political reason why everybody was trying to avoid the R word in the conversation last year. But the reality is that in a lot of ways, you kind of maybe check the box on that. And so here's the thing, and I, I guess it's easy to it's easy to get whipsawed in this kind of environment, right? You think one thing is going to happen and then something totally else happens. We talk about this all the time um, when it comes to managing your money. If you, if you start trying to make investment decisions, sort of anticipating the future, you're never going to be able to guess it. You're never going to be able to really predict what can actually happen. And then there's a ton of studies that say when you do try and do that, you wind up dramatically underperforming. So we're going to take a break. When we come back for the break. We're going to talk about what just happened this past week in terms of the markets and what that may tell for the future. So certainly interesting topic. Uh, we hope you join us after the break here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Plan. Talking about some of the frustrations that you and I and sort of the rest of the folks that have investments out there feel on a regular basis. It, it, it all, it's always amazing, even after doing this for 25 years, just how quickly sentiment and the markets can really change. And it almost seems like we've, we've sort of seen that over the course of the past 30 days where the media, you know, almost like has gone from this story about the recession is coming into you know, making it probably one of the most widely anticipated recessions ever expected to the question that you're hearing sort of a growing thought on is, well, did it already come? And we just missed it because last year being a political year, nobody wanted to deal with the R word, but First quarter, second quarter of last year, negative economic growth as measured by the GDP. That certainly would check the box, if you will, on the technical definition of what a recession is. So, and it underscores sort of the cost, right? The, the, the cost of getting hung up in this 
headlines that change nearly every week, easy to get whipsawed. And, and as we were saying before the break, a lot of studies say that that then causes people to make investment decisions and ultimately winds up because those investment decisions aren't terribly consistent when you're sort of making decisions in reaction to the headlines, whatever they may be, because they change again tomorrow. As a result of that, you wind up not achieving the kind of return that you should be achieving over time. And that basically translates to the fact that you have less money in retirement. So that's certainly not a good thing. And so we wanted to kind of look at some of the stuff that has been happening over the course of the past couple of weeks. And one of the headlines that you may have seen is that the stock market this past week and even sort of the week before as well, kicked off a new bull market. So let's pause there for just a second, sort of talk about sort of what, what all of this means in technical investment type language, if you will, just to kind of make it make sense. So here's the definition. So when a, the market declines by 20% or more from sort of a peak, then that puts the market into what is known as bear market territory, right? And so in order to kind of escape that bear market territory, the market then has to reverse itself by 20% over the course uh, or from that bear market low. So if you think about the markets, they go down 20%, okay, boom, we're now in a bear market. If the market subsequently go up 20%, then okay, great, we're in a bull market. And here's the thing, every bear market, has been followed by a bull market. Every bull market has been followed by a bear market. Every bear market followed by, you get the trend. So that's the cycle. The really good news though, that you have to remember as an investor is that bull markets last much, much longer and produce a much greater positive result than the bear market. So to exit a bear market and start a new bull, then there has to be sort of a rise by the markets of 20% from sort of that low point. And so obviously early last year in 2022, markets have declined by a cumulative amount of 20%, shifting the market out of the bull that had run in 2021 uh, over to a bear market for the year 2022. Well, long comes, you know, kind of the end of the year and the year 2023 and what's happened over the course of the past eight months is that lo and behold, you have a market that has increased by 20%, thereby flipping the bear to a bull. So that's the sort of the technical investment language stuff behind the headlines. And certainly that's pretty exciting stuff, right? I mean, better to be in a bull market than a bear market, right? And bull markets is better for your money than a bear market. So that's good. But we've got some interesting data that we want to share with you that goes hand in hand with this bull market, the bull is back kind of conversation and headlines that we've seen over the course of the past couple of weeks. So welcome on into the program. This, of course, is Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. One of Central Florida's longest running radio programs, also one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web. So make sure you check us out on our website at nelsonfinancialplanning.com. And if you've got any questions or if you've got a topic that you you would like us to talk about on the program, well, that's how you can reach us and say, hey, Joel, I want to hear about ABC or I want to uh, your opinion on DEF, whatever the case may be. Uh, that's how you can reach us and become an active participant in the program itself. My name, of course, is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson financial planning, where we got a team of great folks who also happen to be certified financial fiduciaries. They stand ready this week to help you change your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan. So what are some of the exciting sort of statistics behind this flip from bear market to bull market that has happened over the course of the past two weeks? And certainly, History has seen a lot of these changes because that's sort of the cycle, right? A bear market is always followed by a bull. A bull market is always followed by a bear. And, you know, you get the picture. So 
One of the things that is interesting is the data in terms of frame of reference for how long this bear market that we saw in 2021 and into 20, I'm sorry, into started in the end of 2021 and then into the beginning of 2023 is actually the longest bear market in 75 years lasted for a 200 a total of 248 trading days without having that requisite 20 percent plus recovery to flip it out of bear and into bull so it certainly had run a long time and the interesting stat is it was the longest in 75 years that says a lot about how uh much i guess pain uh, as investors that you may have been that you may have been feeling how much concern how much worry uh, because there wasn't that reversal that you typically would expect and it has always happened in sort of a shorter time period this one took a while uh, and in fact was the longest in 75 years so but that has finally happened uh, again you know bear markets lead to bull markets it's a pretty consistent track record but here's the interesting data and so hold, hold on your hats for this one. Don't be careful. I don't want you to get too excited about what we're next going to say, okay? Because I think it's way too early to call all clear and it's all sunshine and roses and all that kind of stuff. And we don't really follow that process anyway because we think it's more important to be consistent, to not get too caught up in whatever's going on on any particular day, month, quarter, year, or what have you. But here's the suggestion that history has for us. There may be continued opportunities ahead. Traditionally, markets keep rising after kicking off a bull market. Since 1950, if you look at those recoveries, those, those bears turning to bulls, the S&P 500 rose 92% of the time over the course of the next 12 months after that flip from bear to bull happened. Pretty interesting. The average, 19%. Stop and listen to that. That's a pretty good number, right? What would an extra 19% on your investment portfolio look like over the course of the next 12 months? Sounds good, right? I mean, well, I mean, what does it take? Well, it, it, it takes not getting hung up in the sentiment of the day uh, where uh, that's going to throw you off uh, because at, you're going to overreact to some headline. And maybe you already did. Maybe, maybe you missed the last period of time where there was a run up uh, on uh, the course of uh, the market. I mean, obviously, you know, if you go from a bear market to a bull and then it's like a 20% rise. Maybe you missed that already. Maybe, you, maybe you're like halfway behind, but we would say, well, you don't want to continue to fall behind. The strategy of getting in when you feel like it and getting out when you feel like it is no way to ultimately achieve long-term investment results. So certainly in some interesting stats, some interesting historical numbers, again, probably too early to call all clear, but some interesting data that has happened over the course of the past week, just this past week, right? We saw the inflation data at 4%, down from 4.9% from the prior month certainly half or less than half of what it peaked at last year at 9.1%. And then the Federal Reserve saying, hey, we're going to, you know, pause and see how all of these these prior interest rate increases hang out, uh, play out. So some interesting stuff there in terms of kind of how all of that plays out. Here's the call to action, if you will. Uh, might be good to check out your investment mix and your investment portfolio to make sure that, hey, Am I really participating as well as I should be if the market is going up? I certainly want to be able to be participating in that upswing in the market. So make sure you take a moment and really double check what your investment portfolio and your investment allocation looks like, particularly in times like this. With, this, with that, we'll take a break and continue here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. Social Security, right? We know it. We love it. Well, I don't know. Love might be a pretty strong word, right? But if you don't hate it, and you really shouldn't, right? Because you got a bunch of your money, your paycheck going into it every single time you get a paycheck. A total of 6.2% of every dollar that you make goes off to Social Security. And then your employer is also doing the same. If you're self-employed, well, then guess what? You get to do both parts of that. So certainly... 
might want to have a better understanding of some of the nuances in Social Security because for a program that's been around a long time, almost 90 years, there's a lot of misconceptions, right? And these misconceptions can cost you money, your money, in fact, because it was your money that went to fund the program. So, and certainly, you know, we get it. I mean, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of conversation about media on the media, internet, TV, even radio, right? There'll be a host of people talking about all kinds of different pieces of social security, all kinds of different strategies, all of that. So much information, and sometimes that information is conflicting. So easy to understand why people may get confused, uh, combined with the fact that the overriding kind of question in everybody's mind is, well, is it really going to be there when I get to retirement age? And let me just take a side note and answer that question. The answer is going to be yes. It might not look the way that it looks today, and you might have to be older to collect, but yes, it will be there in some form and fashion. But that's not the topic for today's program. Today's program is that we wanted to dig into some of these misconceptions and, and put to rest some of those misconceptions that are out there in an effort to try and help people make good decisions and, more importantly, get all of what they're entitled to out of Social Security. So the, 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 this first misconception is one that we hear probably the biggest or the most, if you will. And I, I you know, whenever we talk about this with, with a client, I can just see the anguish kind of coming across their face when we talk about this one, because for a lot of people, there's this belief that your Social Security, you don't have to pay taxes on that. And when we tell them that's not the case, well, then that really changes people's reaction, right? I mean, if you think you're getting something without having to pay taxes on it, and then I'm sitting here and they're looking at the tax return and saying, well, yeah, you have to pay taxes on it. You're required to do that. Um, and, and that can be a big surprise to a lot of people. Who do you blame for that, by the way? Well, you blame, I guess, one of the more popular presidents, one guy by the name of Ronald Reagan in 1984, signed the bill uh, that made Social Security taxable. The real problem, and this really kind of, bothers me, and it should sort of stick in your craw a little bit too, is that when you pay taxes on Social Security as part of your income tax return, you would think that it would be a good idea to say, well, wait a minute, if these people are collecting Social Security and then they're turning around and paying taxes on it, so that's kind of like right, paying back some of the Social Security to the government, wouldn't it be a great idea if they like took that piece and put it directly back into Social Security to help shore up the program? Sounds like a pretty good idea, right? I, I get the income from Social Security. I pay tax on Social Security. So in essence, I'm giving back some of the Social Security in the form of taxes. But unfortunately, it just goes, I guess, to the greater good of the federal government because they don't carve it out. But what a great idea if they would, right? And then that way, uh, those dollars that are coming out and then the dollars that are getting sort of trimmed off the top that are going back to uh, the federal government are earmarked for Social Security. It's a really good idea, frankly, um, in my opinion, but one that unfortunately they don't do in Washington. So bottom line is um, be prepared to pay taxes on your Social Security. About 40% of the population when they receive Social Security benefits does pay income tax. So about half and half in rough numbers. Uh, there's some income limits that determine whether you pay taxes on your Social Security. But here's the problem. We certainly talked about this before on the program. Those income thresholds, those income limits were set back in 1984 and really haven't changed at all. Well, not really haven't changed. They haven't changed over the course of that period of time. So what that means is that more and more people, just as you get simple inflationary increases in, for example, Social Security or pension or whatever the case may be, then you wind up having more income, which means that you are far more likely to trip these thresholds and then create tax on your Social Security. So certainly something that you want to be absolutely clear on, particularly because those thresholds have not changed or been indexed for inflation, more and more people find that, oh, I'm paying 
tax on my social security. So make sure that you know that going in. When you start to collect social security, always a good idea to kind of figure out where you are on the thresholds. Remember, odds are pretty good that, you know, yeah, you're going to pay taxes on your social security, particularly if you think about the road ahead, more and more people are finding that they have to pay taxes on their social security. So that's a big cost, right? And you need to know that that cost is out there and account for that. Otherwise, you wind up paying a lot more on your taxes than you realize. So that's just one sort of misconception about Social Security and how it could potentially cost people if you don't really appreciate that it is taxable. Um, the other thing that, that, that we find people kind of run into a lot is that there is this notion that your filing decision for Social Security is in fact final. Like once you submit, there's no way that you could possibly reverse course. Um, and, and, and we understand that fear out there, right? That, that you're going to get locked in. Uh, you, you might miss out on something. You make a decision. Maybe it wasn't the best decision, uh, but there's no way to correct it. Well, that's not true. In social security world, uh, you have uh, up until the first 12 months of collecting it to actually change your mind. Now, Here's sort of the little kicker on that. If you if you do that, you're only allowed to do it once um, and you have to pay back everything that you collected. And that repayment also would include any Medicare benefits uh, that were deducted from the Social Security. So certainly some things to be thinking about there in terms of Social Security and, and some of the misconceptions that are out there and how that they can cost people money on a regular basis. So uh, we're going to take a break. When we get back, we're going to continue the conversation on dollars and cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. My name, of course, is Joel Garris, certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary with Nelson Financial Planning, where we got some good folks that stand ready this week to help you change your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan. So check us out and give us a call uh, at our phone number, 407-629-6477, or visit our website at nelsonfinancialplanning.com. Talking a little bit about some of the misconceptions about Social Security and how that could potentially be costing you money. We're going to delve into a couple more of those, but let me take a moment. I, I didn't do this at the top of the show, but... Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, me included. Uh, we're looking forward to spending time with uh, the three boys later on today. Uh, hopefully they remember this Father's Day. I'm sure their mother did a good job at reminding them. So happy Father's Day to all of the dads out there. Hope you have a great day indeed. So welcome into Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. One of Central Florida's longest running radio programs. Also, uh, one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web. So make sure you check us out on your favorite podcast channel of choice, whether that be iTunes or Amazon Music or Spotify, whatever the case may be, we are there along with our YouTube channel. If you have any trouble finding us on any of those platforms, go to our website and you'll see icons that will directly connect you to our channel on those particular platforms. Once you're there, make sure you hit the subscribe button because that means that you won't ever have to kind of search for us again and you'll get notified when we post new material on those platforms. My name, of course, is Joel Garris, Certified Financial Planner, Certified Financial Fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning. Don't hesitate to go to the website either at nelsonfinancialplanning.com to ask us your question. We always uh, like the program to be interactive. And so if you've got a question or topic that you'd like to hear from us, uh, certainly that's a great opportunity to join in and engage with us on the program. So talking about some of these social security myths that ultimately could certainly be costing you. And this next one is a biggie as well that I think certainly you hear a lot about it, but sometimes people sort of miss it. And that's this notion of working while you are earning social security. And you've gotta be real careful here because if you misread this or misinterpret the numbers on this one, you could find that you wound up taking Social Security and took a reduction in it because you took it before your full retirement age. 
And then that always comes with a reduction. And then lo and behold, beyond that reduction, you wind up actually having to give some of that back because you were still working or maybe you worked and you didn't really plan on working that much, but lo and behold, you did and voila. Now you've got a bunch of earned income, work income, and that makes you ineligible for your social security. So those are the things that you've got to be careful of that a lot of th people th sort of lose track of these rules and what it means. So the, the income threshold right around about 21,000 before uh, for this year, it's actually 21,240 for the year 2023. If you're working and again, retirement income doesn't count, dividend income doesn't count, rental income, that doesn't count for earned income. It's gotta be working income. But if you're working and you're above that threshold and you're below your full retirement age, then guess what? you wind up giving back a dollar for every $2 that you earn, a dollar, giving back a dollar of your social security for every $2 that you earn above that threshold of that $21,240. So it's not a particularly big threshold. So it's one of those things that you have to be really aware of when you wind up applying for social security while you are still working. And there's different rules for like the year in which you reach your full retirement age, then the income cap goes up to a much bigger number. And then it's like uh, you get, the, you lose a dollar for every uh, $3 of earned income that you're above the limit. Of course, once you reach full retirement age, and this is the piece that sort of, I think gets forgotten. Once you get reach your full retirement age, which for most people these days is 67, although we're kind of in that, uh, that zone of, of graduation up from 66 to 67. So some people may find that your their full retirement age is 66 and eight months or 66 and 10 months, those kinds of things. The reality is that once you get to that full retirement age, then you can make whatever money you want as earned income and ultimately not have to give any of it back. So key component is make sure that you know what the eligibility requirements are, what the earned income limits are, particularly if you are still working and collecting Social Security under that full retirement age. And then sort of lastly, or, or one of the misconceptions is this notion that everybody is eligible for it. Let me assure you that not everybody is eligible for it. You've got to have your quarters in. So one of the things that you should be doing is looking at your Social Security statement and making sure that there's a bunch of numbers in all the different years that the folks that Social Security have on record because that record will show that work history. And you got, if you've got a bunch of zeros, then you may not be accruing enough to ultimately be eligible to get Social Security. Don't forget as well that there are certain, some jobs that ultimately where you're not contributing to Social Security. The best example of that is if you are a public school teacher in some states where if you didn't pay into social security, you instead solely paid into a pension. Well then, okay, that's fine. You get the pension, but whatever you did, whatever the, the, the amount of money that you were making doesn't qualify for social security. My mom is a perfect example of that. She was a school teacher up in, uh, up in Maine. And that's exactly how the public school system in Maine works or I guess worked at the time, uh, whereby you don't pay into social security. So that means that like her social security benefit is really small, solely based upon some, sort of some other work that she did during the course of summers and uh, when she retired. Uh, so the social security amount is only like, you know, a couple hundred bucks kind of thing. Um, and, and so that's a good example of where you can't count on social security because if the deal excludes social security, then it's not coming to you. So make sure you know whether you've eligible or not. Make sure whether you're putting in the quarters along the way uh, when it comes to uh, social security. So certainly some, uh, uh, some important things there. And then sort of lastly, um, Social Security itself is not automatic if your spouse passes. I'm reminded of a conversation we had uh, just a couple of weeks ago with someone whose spouse had passed about a year and a half ago, and they were still struggling with cash flow because when they passed, the Social Security stopped. And in their particular case, she happened to be younger than him, and so she was only in her 50s when he passed. So 
the Social Security did not continue uh, because that's not automatic. You have to be at least age 60 in order to get a survivor's benefit when it comes to Social Security. So widows certainly eligible for Social Security benefits often get, you know, kind of the step up to that full amount of Social Security and then whatever they were receiving will go away. That's generally how it works. But a real exception exists if there's a little bit of an age difference or uh, not quite in your 60s, then you're not going to be eligible for that widow's benefit until age 60. So certainly some interesting things uh, in, in terms of some of those misconceptions about Social Security uh, that we wanted to kind of talk through on the program today. Uh, we think the best course of action is to, before you make a Social, social Security decision, that you take some time and make sure uh, and understand that and see if you've got all of the information uh, that you might want to make that Social Security decision. We often encourage folks to visit uh, with a professional on that. And there's folks uh, that are uh, that have credentialed to be National Social Security Advisors. Uh, we've got one of them in our office, Rob Field. Uh, he's also a certified financial fiduciary. He's certainly joined us on the program many times before to talk about Social Security. But the, the reality is there, and we can't emphasize this enough, before you make that decision, we think it's best that you talk to somebody that would also be an expert. Certainly you want to talk to the folks at Social Security as well, the 1-800 numbers, things like that. They're a very good resource of information as well. But to take the time to really kind of talk it through so that you don't let any of these preconceived notions about Social Security lead you to a bad decision, to cost, ultimately cost you money because you made a bad decision when it comes to to Social Security. So certainly some interesting things to keep in mind on that. Well, my goodness, we wound up going much longer on a couple of those topics and we ran out of time to talk about health savings accounts. So we're going to table that one to next week. So you got to listen to us next week to hear all about that uh, because that's about it for this week's episode of Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. If you like what you heard and would like to learn more about how our team can help you improve your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan, go to our website, Nelson Financial Planning, and fill out the contact form to set up a free conversation. And remember, we don't believe in account minimums at Nelson Financial Planning because our purpose is to help you get a financial plan with better results at a lower cost. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there.